The Twisted Case of J.C. Dugard, captive for 18 long years, is one of the most chilling missing person cases. How it was solved boiled down to one person's intuition. June 2006, Officer Lisa Campbell, in charge of screening people for event coordination at UC Berkeley, sits at her desk flipping through paperwork. There's a knock at the door. A wide-eyed, bearded man, barely able to keep still, appears with two teenage girls slightly behind him. They don't share his excitement, but rather seem to be on another planet. Something about this man is off and years of law enforcement has polished Lisa's intuition, a hunch that something wasn't quite right. 1991, 11-year-old J.C. Dugard was on her way to school on her bike on a chilly morning. That night, she planned on asking her mother if she could shave her legs for the big trip to the water park. After all, she didn't want to be made fun of. She was stopped in her tracks when a car pulled up beside her. Assuming the driver was looking for directions, young JC sided up to the window. Her mother had always taught her to be kind to others. Before she could think, a hand jolted out of the driver's window. She felt a spark and could barely move. Frantically pushing herself back onto the grass, her hand brushed against something hard and sticky, a pine cone. She grabbed a hold of it, but eventually had to let go when she was picked up by the stranger and shoved into the car. This pine cone was her last connection to freedom. JC's stepfather, Carl Proven, was following not far behind after seeing what happened, but quickly lost the captor's car, never to be seen again. JC's mother, Terry Proven, was devastated when she heard the news. She immediately called the police and alerted her neighbors asking them to keep their porch lights on in case JC was able to find her way back home. But JC didn't return home that night. Later that year, JC was featured on Missing, Reward, and on America's Most Wanted trading cards. In 1992, local band Perfect Circle recorded a song called JC Lee, which featured a spoken message from her mother. On her birthday, a tree was planted in her honor. In 1993, her mother, Terry, appeared on the Geraldo Rivera show to discuss the disappearance and effect on the family. In 1995, a short film was used as a pilot for a show called Stolen Lives. In 1996, a shrine was erected at a spot where she was abducted to mark five years of disappearance. In 1998, Terry told the story for a video called A Child's Life, hosted by Ken Bowers, which taught children how to avoid kidnapping. And in 2001, she created a school program called A Fighting Chance to keep children safe. Despite everything, authorities were unable to find JC. The only basis the police had to go by was the vehicle, a late model 1980 gray Ford sedan, and one of the abductors described as a 32-year-old woman, 5'5", with long dark hair and a dark complexion. This, unfortunately, wasn't enough to find JC. 1991. Pushed into the backseat of a car, a blanket was pulled over JC. Where were they taking her? Why her of all people? Who was this man? Was he her real father, here to finally meet her? The car stopped abruptly, and the captor let her out. Now able to get a better look at him, she saw he was an older, tall man wearing a long, unkempt beard, but had a friendly demeanor about him. Nevertheless, she was still scared. Would you like some water? He asked. She nodded. He brought her into the house and she was greeted by two cats. As an animal lover, JC really wanted to pet him. Would he let her? He took her to the bathroom and had her shower. It was extremely uncomfortable. She wanted to be anywhere but there. On went the blanket once again and she was brought to a shed where he handcuffed her. A train sounded a racket she would be sure to remember. They were by a train station. She should have been at school by now. Her teachers were definitely worried. Over the next 18 years, JC would be assaulted, 
sometimes several times a day while her captor would be on his drug runs. To hide from the pain, she would make up stories in her head, disconnect to a different world. To make her feel better, he would tell her that she was preventing other girls from being hurt and was helping him with his problem. He would also try to comfort her by hugging her and feeding her fast food, a tactic often used to grow children. She learned his name was Philip Garrido and begrudgingly enjoyed the little company she was given. When she told him she was lonely, he caught her a cat that she named Tigger, but he was shortly taken away. Throughout the years, she had other cats that mysteriously disappeared. In her journal, she wrote about her cat Eclipse adoringly, who would comfort her when she was sad. JC would spend her time writing in her journal about her cat, but made the mistake of writing her own name. Philip angrily ripped it off the page and told her that she was no longer JC. She decided to go by Alyssa, after her favorite actress Alyssa Milano. Sadly, Eclipse was also taken away after a few months. She was moved between two buildings, and eventually, Philip's wife Nancy reveals herself. JC spent an Easter with her because apparently Philip was on an island with his friends. She later learned this was a lie, however, and that Philip had broken his parole for failing a drug test and was in jail that month. When he came back from jail, he was becoming even more erratic, claiming to hear voices in the wall and that the angels were to blame for all his wrongdoings. Shortly before Easter of 1994, JC started to feel weird. She was bloated and began waddling instead of walking. She associated the waking with all the fast food she was being fed, but Philip and Nancy knew something was wrong. JC was scared to find out she was pregnant. Philip spent the next few months watching birthing videos he rented from the library. He would perform the birth himself. JC was worried at the thought of giving the baby up, how lonely she already was, and how lonely that would make her. But she was comforted when Philip told her they would be keeping the baby. 1996. When the baby girl turned two, Philip had a more stable job and decided to fence in the backyard for more space to play. While the tiny baby was allowed in the backyard, but to avoid prying eyes, JC wasn't. Not long after, 17-year-old JC fell pregnant again. She was ready for the pregnancy this time and was a lot happier in her environment. Philip had started his own business card printing company and JC would design and print the cards. The job was time consuming and she didn't feel as lonely. In November 1997, JC gave birth to her second child. Nancy felt jealous as she was unable to conceive so the daughters were to call Nancy their mother and call JC their sister. JC would spend her days working on Philip's business or teaching her children from worksheets. Strangely enough, JC was allowed on outings with the family and would sometimes go out to do her nails with Nancy. She never thought to ask for help, always in constant fear that nobody would want to help or even be able to. Philip Garrido was a known sex offender who was let out of prison on an early bail. He was in his late 30s when he kidnapped young JC Dugard with his wife, Nancy Garrido. The couple met in 1976 when Nancy was visiting a family member who was in jail and fell for Philip. He was serving 50 years for assault Catherine Hall, but it wouldn't be long until he was out on parole, only serving 11 of the years. This wasn't his first misdemeanor, as he had abused a minor only four years earlier, but was let out early because she refused to testify. Scarily enough, Video footage was uncovered of Nancy pretending to record Philip playing music in a park, but instead filming little girls who were playing. An eerie comment could be heard from Philip when he asks his wife if the focus was good. A paranoid man, Philip was fixated on religion. He was convinced that he was in communication with angels and even had a blog where he would write his findings. This witness is to gain the attention of unbelievers worldwide including scientists, physicists, and educators. Why? To begin a major wake-up call that allows the rest of the world to turn and know that he exists and is desiring that everyone come to know him. The creator's work is all over the world and belongs to him alone, to speak for himself and not for me or any one person to act as though we speak for him. In this chilling and twisted blog, 
He also has several scanned Declaration of Affirmations that he allegedly had people sign, affirming he was able to control sound with his mind, something he would often use to manipulate JC. Over the course of her 18 years of captivity, Philip's parole officers visited his house 30 times, but JC and her daughters were not discovered. In a video release by the El Dorado District Attorney's Office, Nancy is seen recording Philip and the parole officer. It appears that Philip is guiding the officer through the house, who never thinks to look at the backyard. On one occasion, an officer even spoke to JC, making her think he didn't really care. Even when the ankle bracelet Philip was issued showed that he spent a long time in the backyard. Home videos recovered show the children playing outside in plain sight and being out in public. Philip Garrido was never reported to have any children and was a sex offender. Yet when a neighbor reported seeing children in tents in the backyard, there was no investigation. J.C. Dugard eventually attempted to sue the federal parole officials under the Federal Tort Claims Act, who failed to report these violations. But the court ruled against her. Despite the fact that there were 70 undocumented cases of him breaking his parole due to drugs, Judge Owens explained that while our hearts are with Ms. Dugard, the law is not. It was argued that rehabilitation programs have no obligation to the welfare of private citizens while regulating parolees. Instead, the government paid J.C. Dugard a settlement of $20 million. Entering Officer Lisa Campbell's office on June 25, 2006, Philip Garrido was excited for a scheduled meeting. He would tell her all about his black box project and how he would save the world. He dragged his two daughters behind, who didn't seem to share his enthusiasm. Officer Ali Jacobs was asked by Officer Lisa to join in the meeting. The first thing she noticed was the distant look the girls wore. She had children of her own, and these girls were not acting like typical teenagers. The night before, when Lisa had approached her, Ali decided to run a criminal record check on Philip and learned that he was on the federal parole for abduction and Showing up with a couple of teenagers was a red flag for both of them. While Lisa listened to Philip's nonsensical ramblings, Ali took the chance to speak with the girls. They were pale, their responses robotic, and their outfits were outdated. They told her they were homeschooled and had an older sister. When the three left, she made a call to Philip's parole officer, who told her that he didn't have any daughters. Not much later, she would receive a frantic phone call from the parole officer about some kind of kidnapping. Meanwhile, at the Greedo residence, Nancy was running around in a panic. Philip had been arrested. A parole agent from the Conrad Parole Office visited the next morning, requesting they go down to the office. Taken into questioning, JC kept repeating what Philip wanted her to say, that her name was Alyssa, the children were hers, and it was consensual. But the officers knew something was wrong. Philip had told them an entirely different story, that the girls were his brother's daughters. The inconsistency in stories scared JC, so she began telling the officers that she was running away from an abusive husband and that Philip was just covering for her. After an officer threatened to get her fingerprinted, she finally revealed the truth. She still wouldn't say her name, but told the officer she was kidnapped at 11 and that she was now 29. She then wrote down her name for the first time in 18 years. JC's mother's house was called, and her baby sister, now an adult, picked up. Scared that her mother would learn of her children and not want anything to do with her, JC was relieved to find out that a mother's love knows no bounds, taking her granddaughters in with open arms. But JC couldn't go home just yet. JC and her girls were brought to a hotel until a house was found for them by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. JC Dugard has been out of captivity for 12 years now. With the help of her therapists and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, JC and her daughters were able to transition to a real world. A huge part of her rehabilitation was working with animals. She was also provided a personal chef who would focus on making healthy meals for a healthy mind rather than the fast food she lived on for 18 years. To her former captors, JC has this to say, Philip Garrido, you are wrong. I have the freedom now and all of your so-called theories are wrong. Everything you have ever done to me, 
has been wrong, and someday I hope you could see that. What you and Nancy did was reprehensible. You called yourself an honest man, but these are just words to you. They were your tools of choice, and you wielded them with brute force. To you, Philip, I say that I have always been a thing for your own amusement. I hated every second of every day of 18 years because of you and the perversion you forced upon me. To you, Nancy, I have nothing to say. Both of you can save your apologies in empty words. For all the crimes you have both committed, I hope you have as many sleepless nights as I did. I am angry because you stole my life and that of my family. Thankfully, I am doing well now and no longer live in a nightmare. You do not matter anymore. After being hounded by the press for photos and to prevent rumors of her trying to hide her daughters, JC allowed People Magazine to take a photo of her and her girls with their backs to the camera. JC has since written two books, A Stolen Life, A Memoir, and Freedom, My Book of Firsts. She hopes to help other survivors of sexual abuse and abduction. JC has even started her own charity organization called the JAYC Foundation, providing counseling and protected housing for victims and families who have dealt with traumatic situations, creating successful school programs, and workshops for law enforcement. A lesson learned from this case, if you see something, say something. Thanks to the heroics of two police officers, three lives were saved, who now in turn save more. The last thing JC reached for before her childhood ended, a pine cone, has become her symbol of freedom, a part of nature that connects the victims to the very roots of humanity. It can also be a reminder of how quickly your life can change in the hands of a twisted individual.